Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, shipmates. And, and uh, here, here we are going out again into the shimmering uh, Adriatic Sea, uh, which is um, sometimes called the Caribbean of the Mediterranean and things like that, just because the water is so clear. There's so many islands and so many um, places to go, as we know. By now, we've already come up through the entrance and in the mid stretches and we still are about halfway up to the Venetian Lagoon where we'll be docking in two days now. Um, but did you have a good time in Dubrovnik? Yeah, well isn't that the, the jewel of a, of a city? And of course it's had its troubles, but uh, you, you may have read there, heard the comment of uh, Bernard Shaw that it was the, par uh, that Dubrovnik was paradise on earth. Um, but actually I think it's paradise by the sea in that it, it's such a spectacular setting, but without the ocean, or rather the Adriatic Sea, I should say, that city would not even be there. It's one of the examples where the maritime culture of the Mediterranean and this stretch of it are paramount. And uh, Venice, of course, was the ruling power battling the Ottomans, and so all these Greek islands we went to, and even Dubrovnik and all the other sections of the Dalmatian coast were... Um, often in contest with these empires. And so today, our host in Dubrovnik, he did mention that after centuries of rivalry and bitterness and war and all this sort of things, um, Venice and Dubrovnik, uh, about six years ago, signed a sister city pact of agreement and exchange and sort of say, well, after all these years, let's get along as neighbors as they should have all along, perhaps. And to, but the, the comment of um, uh, Marco was that <clears throat> the sea giveth and taketh away, and Venice is sinking, and Dubrovnik will last forever, being rather stoutly built, by contrast. Well, anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sea itself, because we, we're sort of dazzled by all of the land and all of the sights, but this arm of the Mediterranean is really a very big bay, and uh, if you look at any uh, Italian maps, they generally call it the Gulf of Venice, which was the presumption that the, it was an Italian sea. It's sort of like the Persian Gulf. Every country has their own name for it because they can't agree with their neighbors. But we went through the Strait of Otranto by Corfu, Brindisi, up to Kotor, Dubrovnik, where we are now, and now we'll run up to Zadar. Um, this sea is the product of the tectonic plates back going back millions of years that uh, form these different land masses, particularly the whole spine of Italy, the Apennine Mountains, and then the uh, Dinaric Alps, which are the contrasting mountains in Croatia, Slovenia, and down into uh, Macedonia, down to Greece, are basically form a valley. And that valley was filled when the Mediterranean Sea was filled by rising seawaters about 10 million years ago. There had been a, what they call the messianic crisis uh, <clears throat> by, by geologists that they noted that the Mediterranean Sea at one point dried up to the point where it had layers and layers of uh, many hundreds of meters of salt deposits on the, on the seabed of the whole Mediterranean. And this was because, as it was to this day, the flow from the various rivers and the other seas like the Black Sea and the Nile and all are less than the volume of the replacement of the Mediterranean. Only by a constant flow in of Atlantic Ocean water does the Mediterranean keep its level. And over uh, the millions of years, the whole uh, sea has filled up to what we know today. And of course, now it's still rising because of global sea rise level. Um, <clears throat> but that meant that the Adriatic um, Sea was once a lush mountain valley. And most of the prehistoric archaeology of the Mediterranean is actually buried and destroyed under all of the water and the silt and the the, the seabed now, what, what used to be drier land. Well, anyway, we come up to nowadays, and these are the um, EU and UN marine preserve proposals that will try to protect the marine life, which is at a 
critical level of near extinction in many places. And the Adriatic and the northern side, as you can see, number seven on that, is one of the critical spawning grounds for many species because it's warm, shallow, and calm, essentially. And so they have other ones around the Mediterranean to try to stave off the, uh, let's say, the, the great decline in fishing and also extinctions and other impacts of our current time. The um, Adriatic plate actually does extend down around to Sicily even. This is just the substructure of the, of, the, of, the, of the earth and the depth of the fault lines and such so that we have no uh, volcanic activity in the northern end, but of course you go down to uh, Sicily that's, and uh, Mount Etna and other places, there, there's still active volcanoes because of the tectonic plate shifting and the disturbance of the submantle. Well, here we are just where we have sailed up from Corfu up, that's the, f the boot of Italy. I think it's the, the, the spiked heel of Italy, they should call that piece. And then up to the coast where all of the islands of the Dal Dalmatian coast. Now we are already up there just between these two illustrations, but you see there's some 200 or more major islands, lots of tiny little islands all through this. This is the greatest archipelago in the Mediterranean other than the Aegean. Um, and then on the top of the screen is where we go to Venice. But this is an example of the limestone seabed that forms most of the rocks around here. And these you can see in the cliff faces and up even when we drove up above Kotor, there was all this uh, limestone karst formation that often have uh, seashells in them because this has been over the uh, millions of years, uh, mountain uplift has created these kind of walls of limestone and so most of the islands where we are are very porous, softer rock. Uh, of course, they carved them into the city of Dubrovnik and such, but um, the variegation on this coast is quite wonderful. And this is what makes it such a charming place to come visit because there are dramatic vistas and outcrops wherever you go. This was actually off of Corfu, if you remember going there. This is an example over on the Croatian coast uh, you don't see it too clearly, except that on the left side of the picture there, you see the turbulence in the, in the water. That's actually a gushing underwater river that is coming out of the karst um, mountains that have a lot of holes and a lot of underground rivers right into the sea. And so this means that um, much of the bays and uh, areas in the, uh, particularly the upper Adriatic, are actually have estuarial mix of water. It's not quite as salty as other places. In some places, the fresh water floats over the salt water. What this is is a great spawning ground for sea life, and that's why the northern Adriatic in particular is, is <coughs> they're, they're trying to make uh, restrictions on all of its uh, fisheries so that all of this productivity will continue. So here we're again out of Corfu, and then Wherever you go on the, particularly this side of the east shore of the Adriatic, you have so many variegated coasts and beaches and little places to go. That's why it's become now with peacetime a, a booming tourist uh, industry all up and down the coast. But out in the water itself, there is the, the larger counterclockwise east to west and around to south from west to east of the the major currents of the Mediterranean. So the whole basin of this big sea goes around and it similarly is patterned in each of its arms of it. Here the Adriatic, you have these uh, <coughs> currents that come up the coast and return down the Italian coast. So up, up the Croatian coast and down the Italian. And so that creates a regular circulation of minerals and sea life that will often get spawned in the northern stretches and then go back out to the lower ones, depending on the species. And here's an illustration of the runoff that is mostly agricultural, that Italy, between, between its intensive agriculture and industry, has a lot of discharge into the Adriatic. Again, this is both good and bad because a lot of that silt from the Po River Valley and other places um, that are natural runoff are actually mineralized that then feed the subsea uh, life chain. But you'll notice that on the Croatian coast, there's almost no runoff of that kind. Now, often it's nitrogen from fertilizer in the big fields, particularly the Po River Valley, which grows a lot of rice until this year. 
well, this is what it looks like in um, some of the marshlands and um, shorelands where this kind of fresh water coming into the sea then um, is mixed together. And so here's a, one of the bathyspheric measures of the depth of it. You see how shallow it is on the north, of course, but there's a giant drop-off right <coughs> south of Dubrovnik, actually, where we are, where the sea is suddenly going down um, to, you know, 200 more meters deep and then off into the, uh, the depths of the deepest part of the Mediterranean is over 11,000 feet, maybe, maybe uh, 4,500 meters about that at, at, off of some of the Greek islands that have deep uh, trenches. So this is where there's a really a, a quite a difference in the life because the shallows are very shallow and very extensive. But the depths go right down and then they go out into the center of the Mediterranean. So for instance, uh, there, um, uh, there are a remnant population of whales that come in from the Atlantic and they go right on the dip, deepest part of the sea, past Sicily, come in to feed in the Adriatic in that depth. Uh, when we were in Corfu, I was surprised to see that at the monastery, at the uh, Paleo uh, Castelsi Monastery, had a in their museum a box full of gigantic whale bones that they said had been caught off of Corfu back so about so long ago that they didn't they didn't have record of it even, but they they had the bones. And um, again, this is a visitor from the larger ocean that will come up into this area, but now there's very rare sightings of any whales anywhere in the Mediterranean. Well, the, of course, the source of the life uh, chain is the photo and zooplankton, and this is the annual renewal of the sea. The micro, microscopic creatures are uh, will, will bloom in the spring and grow in the summer and fill the sea with enough food for all the higher uh, creatures. And then on the shallows going out into the depths are all many kind of uh, seagrasses. Um, this is of more importance than people realize because a lot of them have been either dredged, filled in, destroyed, so that that is one of the key reasons why there's so much less fish these days, other than the fishing, is the change in the, uh, the edge of the ocean where the usual spawning goes on. Um, <clears throat> then things are more familiar to us, the anemones and uh, other shellfish. There's sort of a general endemic variety all through the Mediterranean. Uh, a lot of little small shrimp Then our our friend the octopus, which every time I see it on the menu, I say, that's one smart creature. I don't know if I want to uh, you know, help diminish their population, but actually they are extremely reproductive. Each female will have tens of thousands of eggs that go spread around, all of a sudden octopus pop up, and they only live to two to three years depending on their their type. And so if, um, if you catch one to eat it, it probably has a, a, a many, you know, descendants right in the sea next to it. So they're, they're actually not endangered, even though now they've been studying them to see how intelligent they are and how they have brains in all their arms and they, they have a lot of capabilities that we still don't quite understand, particularly how to sneak out of a uh, tank. Uh, they were, they've been known to undo latches and things like this to get away from the humans. Well, here's another one in the typical in the, all the Mediterranean and in the rocks and craggies of particularly this coast where it is so mountainous, this is the moray eel. And I'm a diver, so the first thing you learn is you don't poke your finger at a moray eel or, or it'll have a bite of you. And, uh, but I found this picture of them out dancing. This is, you know, you usually only see them poking on the rocks, but these, they're out on a date, I think. That's what's going on. But still, they're a voracious hunter, sort of like the big boa of the sea. And then there's, Lots of different fish, the, the various mackerel, anchovies, um, going up to um, uh, billfish and others. Still, there's some turtles. They were also hunted quite a bit, but they're now making a rebound where they protected the beaches. And many, their, their nesting beaches are being saved for them again. And then some of the higher food chain fish, like the marlin and other <coughs> uh, carnivorous hunting fish, are still in the... Mediterranean, though again their numbers are dramatically down. That now in Europe, most 
fish that you will find in a restaurant in the interior, that all comes from the world market, which means it's getting depleted elsewhere, particularly Africa, in the ocean, that is. And then there's the dolphin. Now, this is the sort of the archetypical marine mammal of the Mediterranean and very, very social. And again, they have had a population decline just because of the lack of food for them. But they will come up in the Adriatic and come nibbling around the area, but they're taboo to catch. And this is actually ancient Mediterranean culture that um, the dolphins were the friend of humanity ever since this illustration tells the tale of when the, um, the demigod uh, Aeolus, who was the, the, became the god of the wind, he would play his lyre. And he was on a, a boat crossing the Mediterranean when they were attacked by pirates and he to save himself, he threw himself into the sea where he was picked up by dolphins. They had been listening to him playing music on the, on the ship before he jumped into the ocean, and then they took him safely ashore. So to this day, dolphins are considered some uh, off-limits for hunting, particularly in the Mediterranean. Well, I'm going to go back down to the, um, the, the shallows here. Um, this is the uh, indigenous seagrass. Um, in other parts, uh, particularly the western me Mediterranean, uh, there has been an um, invasive species called the, um, the zombie grass, which is, looks like this, except it's a one-cell creature. And if you cut it up, it will divide like an amoeba, and it'll just spread invasively. It takes over a lot of the shallows, and so that, that affects the spawning of the fish and, and other creatures that live in it, but that's, you know, like so many other places, you have invasive species that uh, disrupt the ecosystem. In the northern Adriatic, they have this phenomena, which because of the karst formation, the limestone, and the, the quality of the seabed going down deep, it emits a, what they call light hydrocarbons, which is actually uh, methane and other forms of combinations of natural gas, however you, whatever the chemical constitute of it is, but it makes that, what do you say, inter interstitial gas body, meaning that the bubbles are coming up out of the sand in the bottom, and they gather together, and then they will push their way out into the, the ocean above, but what this does is sort of like a constant fertilizer, so in shallows in the seabed, that is a rich area for all the spawning. And then the hydrocarbons go out and get, you know, go up into the atmosphere. I mean, you can see this phenomena around the world. For instance, famously, the Bermuda Triangle is a similar phenomena where bubbles are coming out of gas deposits, forming bubbles, and then they get so big that when they pop up on the surface, they either swallow a ship or knock an airplane out of the air. I think it's still caused by aliens, but that's what the scientists say. But it happens here in a, in a kind of expansive area, and it makes for an unusual bottom life that's called They're on the seabed uh, of these different grasses and uh, animals that live sort of in this rich environment that's sort of fed by gas as a fertilizer. And you get a lot of plankton. These are sea combs. And they're lovely, but uh, they're, they're actually a, a kind of a sponge. So they're there um, taking in water, digesting plankton, and uh, like bivalves, they also will clean the water in the sense that they're always um, you know, eating up the, the plankton so that the water gets clearer and clearer. Uh, as you've seen on the shores around here, the water is particularly clear. That means all these pieces of the ecosystem are working pretty well. Now, that is a sea slug, and that actually moves around eating uh, what they call uh, sea snow, which is all the debris that falls down from the surface of the water, whether it be um, minerals and or other uh, animals, uh, excretia, or other things come down, and so these are the sort of the rhombi vacuum cleaner of the bottom of the sea. And of course, they're a delicacy in some cuisines. I don't think they're available at the sushi bar here, but it sure looks delicious to me. And there are a lot of sponges. There are corals. These are uh, soft corals. Uh, so it's, this is a, also a great place for scuba diving because you have all this clear water with colorful marine life. 
and different fishes. These are giant sponges, actually. They're sort of the big orange ones and the yellow probably have another growth on that one. Um, this is the, the book of a author, who, a marine biologist, who described the shelf of the northern Adriatic uh, as a, um, a uh, fossil, living fossil of many millions of years ago, even hundreds of millions of years ago. And he said that as the Mediterranean slowly filled up, certain species followed the rising seas and then they established themselves in places that had been land before. And what this means is that right on the uh, seabed of this area where we are going, there are um, sea creatures, sponges, and kinds of um, uh, coral that don't exist anywhere else because they were a leftover from so long ago, maybe 500 million years ago to about 100 million years ago, and they still survive in this sea only. Well, here's the uh, pride of the Adriatic. It's called Pineus nobilis, and this is a bivalve. Um, big shellfish. <clears throat> and you can see them in the shops. They are now restricted because they've been so over harvested. And again, you can see they grow up in the, in the seagrass. And, and this is a um, curious clam, if you want to call that, because it actually grows standing up. And then it is, again, filtering seawater and get, having its nourishment from all the plankton and the, 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 the debris in the water. And so there are whole fields of this. And this has been, of course, easy pickings for divers for centuries. But it's mostly picked out and now is protected because this unique standing, sort of a big clam, is um, it'll grow for decades. And so they get bigger and bigger. I mean, you can see giant clams in some parts of the world. But this is the only one that actually stands up to greet you. <clears throat> and so here, here they are. Some divers found them. Um, they are now trying to plant them like they do conch shells in the Caribbean because they've been so taken out for, f for, f for food, they now actually plant them as uh, the seedlings in the, in the ground there on the bottom of the sea to try to have a, har a sustainable harvest. So it's, uh, uh, th that, that particular um, Pinus noble is not quite as big as she is, but it may take a bite anyway. Yeah, this is what you could have gotten in a restaurant. I have not seen it lately because they ban the commercial harvest of them. Now, if they can grow more, you might be able to order uh, <coughs> one on the half shell like that. But you can see the size. It's quite a meal. Well, this, these are the kind of things that are just off the shore where all these people are coming having their holiday. So you have... Uh, all these little secluded be beaches, uh, often there's no town nearby, and so this is where the Adriatic is such an attraction, but it also means that there are always more people that are, want a meal. And then these islands are quite remarkable. As we are going up towards Zadar, you'll be able to see them, particularly in the morning tomorrow, that there's a myriad of them. And again, they all this shallow water between them rarely gets any storms. Uh, there's a bit of cold weather in the winter, but it rarely even s snows anywhere all along the coast at all. Um, and so it's sort of a lush climate that nurtures this kind of um, sea life. But uh, here's one of the Cre Croatian uh, national parks, La Varanka. But you can almost take a step walking out on the ocean on all these little... Uh, so they look like a coral head, but they're actually all limestone. And in Zanar, we have a trip going out to the island of uh, Pog, which is um, a rocky outcrop with very little vegetation. There are some villages up on the top screen. Uh, but th this, this kind of also makes a, a, a constant cliff face down into the sea where, again, right under the water, there's a lot of perforations and passages and underground caves, and this is where a lot of the sea life happens. So here's just some more of the islands that are so dramatic. This one has a lighthouse, Susak, again, Croatia. And this is um, <coughs> up north of, uh, out of Split, Veli, uh, Brjun. And so some of it is agricultural, some of it is some resorts, but, uh, but again, you can just see how um, appealing this place is to go visit, and then if you're a diver, then you have all this calm water to enjoy, or a sailor. As you come up north, it starts to get a little higher, the mountains, just like where we are 
here where there's uh, some more significant hills in the background. But this is why people come here, because of the clear waters. This is the island of Brock, which is uh, on the way north up to going to Zadar. But <clears throat> you can see all the people on the beach, but this is the view of it from above. So you can see the, the, uh, the, the sandy spit and the deeper waters. Um, but this is uh, the joy of the Adriatic, come here and have a bit of sun and fun. Over on the Italian side, it starts getting a little more crowded. For instance, this is at Rimini. And um, it looks like uh, Coney Island uh, that never ends to me. Um, but uh, this is where the population has had so much impact on the, on the sea itself. Now, we were just here all of yesterday, Kotar. Those islands, as I mentioned, were man-made by the fishermen and other sailors who, on their way out of Kotar and the other ports around there, would bring a load of rocks to put on what were originally a little pop-up of an island. And then over the centuries, they added enough rocks so they could build churches. And so those are artificial islands that are there for the offerings of the sailors and the seamen as they come in and out of port. But the human impact goes on. These big industrial developments like in Bar, Croatia, breakwaters, landfill, this is again a problem for the sea because often these are the best places for the spawning of all the sea creatures and they also become the source of all the, the pollution. It has been getting maybe more control but it's also still building ever more. And then there are all the private vessels that come out. The, they estimate there are a million private sailboats and motorboats in the Mediterranean all going out for a day. As uh, someone said, it's, it's the greatest display of pollution from just for pleasure. And of course, they're getting bigger and bigger, and there are more and more of them all the time. So here's Trieste. We're going to go past that on our way north. That's the largest of the cities on the, on the east shore of the uh, Adriatic. And it was famous as a resort going back a long time. It was traded off between Italy and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, now it's back as an Italian city. But again, it has a lot of development. It also happens to sponsor the uh, world's single largest regatta, which for some reason they go, oh, Barcelona. I, so I'm sorry I doubled up the name there. But it, it has thousands and thousands of uh, sailboats that go out. I think it's larger than uh, the races of cows even. <clears throat> and then the glory of the Adriatic, the city of Venice, uh, where we will be in a few days. Again, the city that was built on pilings. I mean, the whole construction of Venice dependent on the, the old growth cypress pilings that they pounded down hundreds of years ago to a certain level so they stabilized the foundation. They could build this city of uh, considerable size sort of floating on the water. And of course the problem is, is that it is being inundated and um, has regular flooding already and so this project, most which uh, is a big tidal gate to control the water flowing in to Venice up there on the left side and other um, islands. But at a high tide or a storm, they plan to close the, the big gates like the Thames gates and other parts of the world where they defend against the rising seas. But this is predicted to have to stay closed all the time in the near future. And then within another 50 years, it'll be useless. The, wa the, the rising sea level will actually cover the whole thing. And I don't know what Venice is really going to do, other than make it a defensive lake around the whole lagoon. Well, but life goes on. Here's a fishing setup in uh, uh, one of the Italian towns, which is sort of about as lazy as a fisherman can get. He has an automatic control to drop a net and just waits till the fish come by and they pick it up and collect it. But he doesn't have to get his feet wet. Um, but again, this is minor toll on the sea. The bigger problem is the sea trawlers that come up, uh, and there are quite a few that are in a number of ports that will take great harvest out of the center of the sea. And then the other impact of humanity has been, well, warfare and competition. So here's a good uh, dust up between uh, the Italian and the Austrian fleet back once upon a time. So this, the Adriatic is also littered with shipwrecks. Um, here's one from uh, World War I where they were, <coughs> I guess they got leaned over somehow. But the, um, nowadays there's a lot of traffic. So this is another problem in pl some places. There's just so many boats coming and going. 
Uh, again, they're not dumping overboard like they typically did until recently, but uh, just the volume of traffic around and about is considerable. Uh, this is one of the Russian-built hydrofoil boats, if you've ever seen those zipping around um, different places. And now they're making electric boats, and that's an improvement for the sea. I don't know if the actual creatures on the bottom of the sea or in the sea appreciate it, but we're, we're the humanity is trying to clean up its act somewhat. And then there are the trans-Adriatic um, ferries. Um, <clears throat> so you can get around all this area and um, appreciate it more. But this is a curious thing that happened last month. I got this on my marine news that a, a, a rather large yacht was called a mayday out on its way from Albania to Italy um, and it somehow took on water <clears throat> and then it uh, it was underway while it was taking on water though and finally it swamped the engine room and the whole thing went down and the Italian Coast Guard picked off four crew but they, they couldn't get a straight answer why were you racing this rather large yacht out when you were taking water. Well, they obviously didn't pay, either they didn't pay their bill or they didn't bother to close a seacock or they were a Russian oligarch who thought he could get away. I don't, I don't know what the story with that is. But anyway, for navigation, the sea is much safer just because it has lighthouses from antiquity and now GPS and different things. So you think you know where you are all the time as long as you have batteries to tell you, to power it. But just below all of that are, again, more shipwrecks, more treasures to be found. Um, this is very much regulated by the local government, so you can't go out there and just uh, be a, uh, a pirate on the bottom of the sea like you can in some places that are not watched that much. But the life is lush just right under us. And by the way, the, that to the lower right side, that is not grass. That's actually a toadfish which is, they get enormous. So he's trying not to be noticed, but uh, he's smiling for the camera. And so I'm going to leave you just to the last picture of the, of the penis nobilis, which uh, I don't think we're going to get to see if you're not a scuba diver, and you won't find it uh, on the menu anymore, but rest assured they're down there growing just for you someday. So this is a you know, remarkable stretch of water. I've been all over the world and somehow the Adriatic is, has both the combination of scenery and uh, beautiful waters and mountains and then interesting ports and a lot of history. Um, and so uh, with the last uh, bit of the sea as we sail on, I'm going to give you a couple of the local lore. This is the Greek Homer said, the land divides and the sea connects. And so the Adriatic Sea, in particular, has been a, a busy thoroughfare for humanity, but it's also survived in its natural way somewhat, and perhaps will have a, a new lease on life with better regulation and, and care and knowledge about it. And uh, the other saying, which actually comes from the Phoenician era, and it's translated in languages for thousands of years, is that the time spent at sea does not add to your age, which is a good reason why you should stay on this ship forever. Right? With that, I wish you a, a good trip, and I hope to see you at our next port and on, on our journey on the Adriatic. Thank you very much.